Thanks, Trafton, and, and good morning, everyone, and, and happy Thursday. As I mentioned, um, uh, greetings from campus. Uh, I am here at UC Berkeley. It's uh, a, going to be a beautiful day, and, and hopefully we'll be seeing a number of you in a few weeks for our VC deal camp. So uh, let's get started. Let me see. Hopefully folks can all see my presentation. Uh, so a little bit more about myself. As Trafton said, I am the executive director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Business. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, program here at the university. Uh, we work across campus, although we're housed at the law school. Um, I do a bit of teaching as well in venture finance and emerging technologies. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started and co-taught the university's first uh, graduate level blockchain course. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I also oversee the university's uh, joint degree program in the law and business school. So uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I like to describe myself as a, uh, prior to being in academia, as a successful social entrepreneur and a failed tech entrepreneur and then a recovering attorney. So uh, I started off my career, uh, I had nonprofit that was quite successful, uh, ran out of Washington, D.C. Uh, then I came to grad school. I, I did business school and law school, uh, kind of fell in love with the tech scene, uh, had my own tech startup. Uh, we failed to, to raise venture capital, so uh, I joked that I, I decided to become a lawyer. I practiced law in Silicon Valley, representing startups and, and VCs, and then I've been back in academia for about five years. Um, we run a number of programs. Our, our flagship program program is our VC Unlock Deal Camp, which we run with 500 startups. Uh, here's some information. This is actually our uh, uh, upcoming is our sixth cohort of the program. We've been running it since 2016. Uh, it's just, it's the highlight of my year. So uh, we work with aspiring investors, um, uh, VCs from family offices, uh, large funds, corporate VCs, angel investors, practitioners. Uh, it's a really great four-day program. Uh, I would note you can see the URL on the screen. Uh, applications for the program do close this Friday. So uh, that's tomorrow. If you think you might be interested, take a look. Um, we do a deep dive into a number of things. So I'll kind of break it down as follows. Uh, first being venture strategy, where we really help you think about how to define and deploy your investment thesis. Uh, we bring in some really great folks for this. Uh, our, our opening lecture is actually uh, by Scott Cooper uh, of Andreessen Horowitz, who wrote a fantastic book this year, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, uh, which I highly recommend, not just because I um, thanked in the book for reviewing an early edition, but uh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And so Scott, uh, who teaches here at Berkeley, will also be doing the, the opening lecture. Uh, then we, we do a deep dive into venture mechanics where we'll, we'll break down venture terms, financing vehicles. Uh, we're gonna give a light touch into valuations today, but we spend a lot of time at, uh, in, in the class. And then my favorite part is venture finance where we actually build different financial models, cap tables. I'll talk a little bit about token finance, uh, uh, but most I think importantly about the program is the opportunity to build an investor network. So I think this is a picture from, a, uh, I see Trafton in this one, but this is from a, a deal camp uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, we still keep in touch with everyone. I, I just counted the number of uh, WhatsApp groups we have for, for all of the, the deal camps, but people invest together, uh, they start funds together. So it's, it's really a phenomenal program and, and uh, has become more of a family for us than anything. So uh, take a look, URLs on the screen, reminder applications close this Friday. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. And, and let me just make sure, Trafton, you're monitoring. I wanna make sure there's no technical difficulties. Looks like we're okay. Yeah, looks like uh, we're okay so far. Very cool. Okay, so how do VCs value startups? They guess. Thank you for coming to my webinar. I will now take questions. You know, these bad jokes don't work as well over webinars because I can't hear everyone laugh. So I'm just gonna assume you all laughed and I'm going to move on. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a bit of a tongue in cheek, although uh, there's more truth to this than we might think and, and we'll dive into that. I'm gonna look at the chat box because maybe I got an LOL. I did, I got a few, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Much more, uh, much, many more and many worse jokes at Deal Camp. So if you enjoyed that, something to look forward to. 
Okay, but let's do a bit of background first before we jump into the valuation question. So uh, I think this chart is, is pretty helpful when we take a step back and, and look at the life cycle of a venture backed company. So the idea being uh, we have a startup, we want to scale that startup and uh, unfortunately uh, our, our founding team does not have the capital to, to finance that growth on our own. So we are going to take money from outside investors, uh, give up some control, give up some ownership uh, in exchange for the capital and resources we need to scale the business. So uh, it, it, actually the, the first uh, financing stage for a startup is the incorporation of the startup. And that's where we make the founders of the startup, the, the owners of the business. So uh, you'll see here, you, you have your founders and they'll often exchange a, a bit of cash and usually intellectual property in exchange for, for their common stock, which we'll talk a bit more about. Then usually the next round of financing is done via angel investors or seed investors or pre-seed investors. I like to call this a convertible round of financing because in exchange for the capital, the, the cash that's being provided to the startup, these investors are, are purchasing something called a convertible security. And, and many of you have probably used these. Um, a couple of the big uh, angel or seed investors, the institutional ones, 500 startups and Y Combinator have their own version of these convertible securities. Uh, these are the safe or the kiss. And, and we spent a lot more time breaking these down in, in deal camp, but for now we'll just kind of provide an overview. Then we have our first kind of priced round we like to call uh, uh, financing. And this is where you'll have, if you look at the green bubble first, a, a new venture capital will provide cash in exchange for preferred stock. And I like to think of preferred stock, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more, but it's common stock with some extra economic and some extra control rights. So kind of common stock plus, but something else will be happening during this stage of financing. Those angel or seed investors will be converting their convertible securities and usually they'll be converting at a discount. So at a price less than the new VC is paying for preferred stock. And this goes on and on as the company grows and builds. And our hope is that this occurs at a higher valuation. Otherwise, we have to deal with things like anti-dilution and down rounds of financing, all things we spend more time on at Deal Camp. But for those of you that, that have spent time in this industry, you know, the idea there is that each subsequent round will be sufficient to get the company to a, another milestone. And ideally that will be done at a higher valuation. So maybe I'm fundraising in the early stages to fund my pilot test. Then maybe I'm fundraising to go to market. Then maybe I'm fundraising to go to market in other geographies, et cetera. But we can kind of look at this and, and describe it or think about has the, the, at least the, the optimal venture life cycle for a startup. And then what we don't see on the screen would be the exit event where the startup either goes public through an initial public offering or is acquired through an M&A event. Uh, one other quick kind of overview. So, so we, we touched on this in the last slide, but this kind of question around what are the structures that we use to, to facilitate venture financing? And uh, I'll put this up here briefly just to kind of uh, uh, get us all on the same page. But you know, traditionally we think of financing a company through debt. And this is the idea of, of borrowing money. And, and we do see this in the venture world, but again, debt, provides a fixed claim. So if I, my startup borrows a million dollars, this entitles the investor or, or lender to a return of that million dollars plus interest over time. We contrast that with equity securities, and this includes both common stock and preferred stock, which we describe as having a residual claim on the cash flows of the business. So if instead of borrowing a million dollars, I take on a million dollar investment, we connect that to an ownership percentage. So let's say the million dollars equates to 20% of the company. That investor has a 20% residual claim on the cash flows of the business, assuming there's no debt to be paid out first. And this is how we would deal with a sale of the company, dividends, et cetera. Uh, something to note, and I mentioned earlier, preferred stock is like common stock with extra benefits, economic and control benefits. Well, here's one of those major economic benefits, and this is what we call, and this probably review for many of you, but a liquidation preference. So in that example I gave where an investor is 
investing a million dollars for 20% of the company, uh, the investor, if it's a standard liquidation preference, will get this benefit that kind of mimics the fixed claim of debt. So they'll actually get the option of either taking their million dollars or converting that million into common stock and getting 20% of whatever the exit M&A, et cetera, is. And then uh, finally, and, and there's actually a fourth window here, which we would describe in, in, in more detail if we had more time, and that might be a, a, a cryptocurrency, but this idea of convertible securities. And, and this is actually what we see utilized for most early stage angel seed investments. And, and again, I like to think of these as kind of a pre-purchase of preferred stock. And, and we'll, we'll spend more time on that. Uh, we do in, in Deal Camp and, and other webinars, but again, just wanted to provide this overview. Uh, what we're gonna spend time on today when we talk about valuations is really this priced round. So we'll be doing some work around a hypothetical Series A financing. So you can imagine maybe a startup has raised a few hundred thousand on convertible notes and those convertible notes will be converting into Series A stock in the price round. Uh, we have seen uh, some startups start to get into trouble here uh, when they raise kind of millions of dollars on convertible uh, securities. And within the industry, there's some pushback here as far as kind of going crazy on convertible securities because they really weren't built to facilitate large rounds of financing and, and you can get into some trouble. If you have questions, we, we do cover this in, in deal camp, but I'm happy to send some links and, and I've written some pieces on this. So uh, definitely more information available there. So let's talk about price rounds before we dive into our exercise. So uh, who knows what this is a picture of? And I'll, I'll look to the, since it seems like some of you are pretty active, uh, I'll look, let's see here. Anyone have, uh... oh, Ali, thanks for, for jumping ahead, but uh, we'll get to that. Trafton, do you know what this, this thing is that I'm showing? Uh, I actually don't. Okay, we got it. It's a tombstone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, also known uh, as a deal toy. So it's this Lucite plaque, uh, almost like a trophy. And, and this was really common in like the 90s and 2000s around the, the dot-com boom and, and then bust where, where someone who's uh, involved in a, a deal, a financing, an M&A event uh, would create this plaque, this, this Lucite toy to commemorate uh, uh, the deal. And then they, they'd circulate it to like the lawyers and everyone that worked on the deal. Um, so these fell out of favor. Uh, they were quite common before the dot-com uh, bust, and then they sort of fell out of favor, and, and uh, they are starting to make a comeback. And, and I've had at least one colleague uh, um, uh, pontificate that there may be some correlation between the prevalence of deal toys or tombstones and uh, a, a bubble. So uh, something to, to keep in mind. But that is a, a picture of one. Um, so just some uh, quick, and, and this will be pretty uh, basic for, for many of you, but let's just talk about uh, some kind of uh, factors of a typical price round in Silicon Valley. Uh, so as we saw from our life cycle chart, it's generally used for scaling up as opposed to starting a, a new business. So uh, historically, uh, the kind of not historically, but in today's VC world, most startups, their, their first outside capital will, will come from angel investors, if they join an incubator or an accelerator, and, and really when they go and do their Series A, uh, it's, it's to scale up the business. Now this is, is uh, num these numbers are all over the place and it really depends on geography, and, and the vertical that we're in. But you know, I like to think about you know, a Series A beginning where uh, an investor is investing between five to 10 million and the VC is typically looking to acquire an ownership stake between 20 and 30%. Least in Silicon Valley, and this is probably conservative, uh, you can expect the legal fees to, to facilitate a Series A financing to be at $50,000 or more. Uh, something to note here is that it's, it's market practice in a, in a price round of financing, a preferred stock financing, that the legal fees for both the company and 
the investor, and it's usually the lead investor that does the negotiation on behalf of all the investors, those legal fees are, are they're often capped, but they'll be covered by the company. Uh, so another way to look at that is it comes out of the, the deal proceeds. This is not the case in most seed convertible angel investment rounds where the investors, if they are utilizing attorneys, will, will be responsible for, for covering their own fees. Uh, these Series A financings can take months to execute. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of pages of legal documents. There's the purchase agreement. There's other uh, legal contracts that, that we negotiate and execute. And at this stage, the investor is, is negotiating and, and taking significant economic and control rights. So let me pause for a second, Traff, then we can see if we've got any questions. Nope, just some good jokes about tombstones, appreciate that. This is good, this is uh, reinforcing that I can tell bad jokes over webinars. Yeah, I see a couple of questions, Adam. I think we can take, some of these are more general, I think we can probably take those at the end. Okay, thanks, you'll monitor those and interrupt me if we yeah. have one. Definitely. Okay, so let's do a simple example of, of how we think about pricing startups. And, and so let's assume me, Adam, I've got a, a startup and, and uh, I, I, when I incorporated the startup, I uh, uh, issued, I created 8 million shares and I issued all 8 million shares to myself. So I'm the sole uh, stockholder of the business. I've found a VC to invest $2 million in my startup and we've agreed that there's going to be an $8 million pre-money valuation. So we've both negotiated and agreed that prior to these, this $2 million investment, my startup is worth $8 million. So we can do a little bit of math and, and we can figure out that if this company is worth $8 million and it took $2 million of capital, that company, the post-money valuation is $10 million. That's pretty simple. We know that the VC will expect to own 20% of the company, right? If they've invested $2 million into a company that's now worth $10 million, $2 million gets us 20% of that company. So to ensure that they're getting the 20%, let's take a look at the price per share and the capitalization table of this company. So we know our pricing formula is basically the valuation of the company divided by the total number of shares. In our example here, we said the pre-money valuation of the company was $8 million. Remember there were 8 million shares prior to the investment. All were held by me, the founder. That gives us a price per share of $1. And then if we take a look at the cap table for this company, which is a ledger of our stock ownership, we've got two shareholders on the first column, Adam and this new VC. I have 8 million shares of common stock. We are now going to sell 2 million shares of series A stock. We get 2 million because it's a dollar per share and they're investing 2 million. So 2 million divided by a dollar is 2 million shares. Our total number of shares, Adam has 8 million, our VC has 2 million. That means we have 10 million shares outstanding. That gives us Adam 80% of the company on a fully diluted basis. I'll talk about that in a moment. It gives the VC 20% for a total of 100%. Now, just some things to recall. Uh, in a few slides ago, I described preferred stock as common stock with some extra economic and control rights. So those control rights include things like board seats, uh, veto rights over certain actions the company might take. The economic benefits include things like the liquidation preference, anti-dilution protection. Let's talk for a moment about the liquidation preference. So if you recall, this VC invested $2 million in this company. Now, assuming that VC negotiated for a standard non-participating liquidation preference, if we sell this company, the VC is going to have a choice. Either they take their money back, the $2 million they invested, and then the remainder of the proceeds will go to Adam, the common stockholder, or this VC can convert each share of com, uh, Series A stock that they have for a share of common stock and take the 20% 
ownership. So if we sold this company, let's say things don't go well and you know, we have a fire sale and we sell this company for $4 million. So the VC can either take $2 million, which would leave 2 million for Adam, or they could convert and take 20%. In that example, the $2 million is much greater than 20%. So the VC is going to take their liquidation preference. But if things go well and we sell this company for $100 million, 20% of 100 million is much greater than just 2 million. So this VC will convert and take their 20%. Let me pause and see if we have questions. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll make uh, this available. Um, I won't now walk through all the differences between preferred and common stock. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time, but if we do at the end, I can come back to that. Uh, let's see what else. We are recording this. Uh, question about uh, caps and convertible notes. We will come back to that at the end, okay. Uh, are you going to be discussing valuation? Yes, we will get there. Um, okay, so let's move on. We've got a very active group. So uh, let's move on. And, and uh, please, uh, at this point, if you can uh, question specifically about what I'm covering, questions about what I will or won't cover, let's wait to the end in case I do cover what you have. Uh, this is a complicated area. We cover a lot. We cover a lot in four days. I'm trying to just touch on one little thing in 30 minutes, but I'll, I'll do my best and I can stay for, for the full hour to answer questions. So uh, if you have kind of general questions, let's save them to the end. Otherwise, uh, please interrupt if there's a question about something specifically I'm covering. Okay, so now uh, a few of you asked this, are we gonna discuss valuation? So uh, where does that $8 million valuation come from? So I, I gave you this example of, of a startup and I said, well, uh, the, the VC and the founder, me, just determined that this startup was worth $8 million. So, so you know, how did we get to that point? Well, what sorts of exercises that we have, could we have done? And so I, I think someone mentioned a few of these in, in their chat. But when we think about, uh, for those that come from the world of corporate finance, right, we have a number of tools that we can use to uh, think about valuing organizations. And, and one that we do is a uh, discounted cash flow analysis. We think about the, the finances of the company and try to project forward what the company might be worth. Well, what if the company is an early stage startup and, and is pre-revenue, maybe even pre-product and, and has no finances? Basically, they have a, a, a pitch deck and a and a team. So how do we use that there? It's, it's difficult. Certainly we can do comparables so we can look at uh, other companies, but, but also difficult uh, if it's a, a new vertical or a new space or a novel technology. Uh, I, I know there's a few others we, we won't get to there. Uh, we can kind of back into it, right? Well, maybe a VC says, listen, I, I'm going to, you need $2 million. Uh, I want to have 20% of the company. So that means that, that the valuation would be the pre-money valuation would be $8 million. And, and that's how we're gonna get to the, the valuation, which is probably drives things more than we might think. And then I was joking before, but there is certainly some sort of kind of guesstimation and, and other factors around what the market might pay. And we'll, we'll talk more about this. I'm, I'm gonna spend a, a lot more on kind of this conversation at the end. And again, we'll, we'll come back to this. So uh, hold questions on that. What I, I wanna do, is jumpstart our exercise and, and uh, which I think will help us think about kind of how valuations are, are derived or not derived in Silicon Valley. So let me just pause and see if I'm missing any clarification questions. Okay, so that the cap table on the last deck that was uh, showing uh, uh, shares, not dollars. Okay, so let's, uh, I, I'm gonna come back to some of the questions that you're asking, but let's get started on our exercise. So um, now what I want everyone to do is kind of uh, uh, clear your minds. Uh, you're 
everyone is going to take the role of a VC. If some of you are VCs, that's great. Uh, it will be easy for you. But imagine that, that you are looking to invest in uh, a, a software platform for uh, augmented reality or virtual reality applications, both consumer and, and enterprise. So think what you're, you're hoping to invest in is, is what we'll call kind of the app store for AR, VR applications. And, and so the idea being, this is kind of a two-sided marketplace where both developers and consumers or, or enterprise companies can come to, to both build and, and uh, acquire AR, VR applications. So again, this is made up. So if some of you have expertise in this area, I apologize for butchering anything, but that's not the point of this exercise. But again, I want you to all imagine that you are looking for early stage startups to invest in this space, okay? What I'm gonna do now is introduce to you one such startup that is building something in this space. This startup is called Virtual Market. And so here are our founders of Virtual Market. Let me tell you a bit about Virtual Market. They are all Berkeley uh, and are Stanford engineers. Uh, they have little to no business or, or management experience. Uh, they're a mix of, of uh, masters and PhD and postdocs. They've more or less have been in the, the lab or, or academia their entire lives. Uh, they do have a, a prototype that they've done some pilot testing with, with potential customers, both developers and consumers, and, and they've received really just phenomenal feedback. People are, are really excited about that. Uh, they, they're new to finance, fundraising. They're, they're fundraising to go to market, to build a sales and marketing team. Um, the company has not yet received any other term sheets. So uh, right now, you're, you'd be basically negotiating against yourself, okay? So... What I want you to do is we have our first poll question. So uh, Trafton is going in just a moment. He's gonna share a poll with you. And what I want you to do is, is not to, uh, you're gonna have a number of options where you can choose a valuation for this company. This, you're, at this point, you're, you're not determining what you would pay for this company. What I want you to do is think about what do you think the pre-money valuation will be for this company Series A. If this was leaked to TechCrunch, what do you think it will be? Again, you're not making a decision on whether you would invest. What you're guessing is, assuming this company does do a financing, what do you think the pre-money valuation will be? What's the value of the company prior to the, uh, 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 the, 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 the money being invested? And if you're guessing, that's great. It's part of the exercise. So Trafton, why don't you share that first, uh, the poll? Okay, great. That should be live right now. Give folks just a couple of seconds to, uh, to place their bets. All right, a lot of great questions. I will at the end go back and through the go back through all of these. So please be patient with me because um, I want to get through this exercise. Um, let's assume in, in this case that the, the, this is the first outside. So the company has this company has not done a seed investment. So this is its first outside capital. There's still a couple of votes coming in, but I think we'll close this in just a couple of seconds. And again, we'll share this presentation and, and a recording of it, I believe, so. And you're asking, all, uh, a couple of you are asking questions about the uh, uh, this company, so. Uh, it, Obviously, if this was the real world, you would spend more time with this company. So feel free to make assumptions um, about you know burn rate, budget, etc. So uh, uh, let's just assume anything that that isn't listed is kind of just standard for for what you might expect of a startup at this stage. Okay, that's a wrap. All right, let's take a look at the results. Can you show us those, Trafton? There they are. 
All right, so they're a bit all over the place. Uh, so it looks like uh, it, it, most of you, the, the most common answer was below 2 million. We got a number of you that were between two and a half, five to 8 million, eight to 10 million, and then it starts to taper off. A few of you would pay 12 to 5 million. So this is good. I think that the results, again, pretty much all over the place, uh, uh, pretty kind of, nice distribution um, with most below 8 million. Uh, if this was difficult, that's good, right? You didn't have much information and you were really just kind of uh, coming from this out of nowhere. You know, maybe a few of you have invested in this space before, so you bring a bit more to it, but this is really good. So now I'm gonna provide a bit more information and we're gonna continue. So you uh, imagine, you know, prior to, to doing this exercise, you had an associate or an intern from your venture capital fund do some research on this market because you're really excited about this market, um, the, the, the AR, VR software space, but you don't have much experience in it. And uh, it turns out that uh, your intern or your, your uh, associate uh, comes, does some research and, and is able to show you that uh, in 2018 and 2019, the, the median Series A valuation pre-money for AR VR software was between 15 and 20 million. Okay, so this is if we looked over the last you know 2018 to 2019, so not including 2020, if we looked at all of the software investments for AR VR, the kind of median uh, valuation was between 15 and 20 million. Okay, so now what I'd like you to do is. Let's go back real quick. We'll come to that. Now I want you to price, uh, actually, let's hold up. We're gonna price startup one again. Let me see if we have a, looks like we had a question. Uh, really good question. If you don't have much experience or knowledge of the market, why are you investing in the market in the first place? Uh, that's a good point uh, uh, for this exercise. It's just an exercise, but we will come back to that. Um, so now what we're going to do is, is uh, complicate things a, a bit. And, and this more accurately reflects how a VC might invest, right? Generally speaking, most VCs aren't kind of sitting around waiting for someone to come with them, uh, come up with a novel idea uh, 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 that they've never heard of before. Although that does happen maybe in, in very early stages or maybe some of the, the incubators or accelerators are investing in, in kind of novel technologies, but most VCs approach this in, in this manner, where you have some domain expertise, and, and Alex asked this question, and, and, and it's correct, where you come to a, let's say here, a, a vertical, we'll, we'll say AR, VR software, and it's a space you know about, you might have experience investing in that space, and then what you're looking to do is invest in a startup or a team that you can think can, can you know, basically uh, capture product market fit, scale, and, and, and more or less win. So, so again, the most common approach is, is to approach a vertical or a investment thesis and then look for the, the winners in that space. So ideally, you'll be looking at a number of investment opportunities, not just one, and then trying to compare kind of the valuations and price around those few. So that's what we're going to do now. So now you're a VC and you're gonna be looking at three different potential investments, all in this kind of AR, VR software app store space. So we're gonna look at that startup one again. So just uh, uh, let me introduce all three startups and then you'll do your exercise. So again, startup one, virtual market. Uh, the founders, again, uh, they're, they're these great engineers, uh, really cool prototype, uh, excellent feedback from customers. Uh, they've not yet received any other term sheets. Here is startup two. Uh, they are called Distort Labs. These are our two founders. Now these founders are both experienced CEOs that have had successful exits with previous startups. Uh, their product, which incorporates blockchain technologies, it's just okay. They have a prototype, it needs some work. They're clearly going to have to hire a head of engineering and, and more engineers in, in the near future. Um, they've not done a pilot test with customers yet. You've looked at the prototype, but they've not done a pilot test. But this company has received a term sheet. Um, so there is other investor interest from a leading corporate venture fund, okay? So this is option two, startup two, distort labs. 
Now let's look at startup three. Uh, this is Reality Bytes. So uh, these founders have very strong connections to Silicon Valley VCs, uh, corporate development teams at major tech companies. So they've been out here for a while. If you go on their LinkedIn, you know, they know the, the, the uh, M&A folks at, at Samsung, at Google, at Facebook, et cetera. Uh, their product is, is also just okay. They'll, they'll also need to hire more engineers and they've also not yet conducted a pilot, but they have received a term sheet from a leading Silicon Valley venture Fund, not a corporate VC, a leading fund like Sequoia and Driesten, first round, et cetera. Okay, so these are our three companies. And now Travis is going to put up three different polls. So the first thing we're going to do is now you're going to take that same poll again. And remember, you've got some more information about the market, about the potential competition. What do you think now with this new information the valuation for virtual markets series A financing will be. So Trafton, you're gonna put, this is the same quiz, you're just redoing your answer. You can put the same answer if you'd like, or you can change it. Just a reminder, this is all anonymous, so don't feel bad about guessing. There's no right answer as of now. All Thanks, right. Trafton. Second poll is up. Give folks just a couple more seconds here. Okay, there we go. And I'll go ahead and share these results out. Okay. So look what happened. We've got a much more even distribution. Um, and, and what did we change? Well, we introduced some comps or some different companies, but I think probably my, my uh, assumption here is what's driving this change or, or these new results is that we've provided a bit of an anchor, right? So, so that information that the average valuation or, or price uh, in the previous year was uh, between 15 and, and 20. So it looks like, and remember, this isn't whether you'd be willing to invest. This was your guess for what you think the valuation was going to be. So it seems like we introduced info that maybe this market is a little bit hotter than, than we initially thought. And so our, our responses adjusted accordingly. Okay. And so Trafton, if you can write down, it looks like our most common uh, response here, let's put, uh, we'll put between five and 8 million. Okay. If you can just write that down. Got it. Okay, so now let's go on. Uh, now we are going to do the same thing, but now you are going to be guessing what you think the valuation will be for Distort Labs. Now remember, these were our successful, uh, uh, our serial, serial entrepreneurs. Uh, their product is, is not as good as, as virtual markets. They need to hire a head of engineering and, and they've actually, but they have received a term sheet from a leading corporate venture capital fund. So, so now uh, Trafton, let's put up the poll for Distort Labs. Should be live right now. Thanks.
OK, a couple more uh, seconds to get your votes in. All right. OK, so let's take a look at this. So it looks like our most common draft is five to eight million. But um, it looks like folks are, are, we have quite a bit more action uh, above 8 million. So maybe for this one, uh, for, let's write down 8 million for this one, for the, the crowd response. And then uh, we'll go uh, uh, 5 million for uh, virtual market. Got it. Okay, now let's value our final company. And then we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time uh, on a discussion. So now what do you think the pre-money valuation will be for Reality Bytes? Now recall the difference here. Uh, these guys, although they haven't been CEOs of startups, they're really well connected in the Silicon Valley tech and VC scene. Uh, their product is also just okay, maybe a little bit further along than Distort Labs. They still need to hire uh, uh, quite a few engineers uh, in the short term. But the major difference here is that Reality Bytes uh, has a term sheet uh, from a leading Silicon Valley VC fund. So Trafton, let's throw up the poll again for Reality Bytes. All right, I think we can close it, Trafton. Let's take a look at our results. Okay, so it looks like we're pushing a bit more. I think we can write down 10 million for this one. Got it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I spoke, uh, I built this exercise, and I've actually been uh, running this uh, in, in courses uh, both here at Berkeley and, and teaching abroad. Um, we often do this as an introduction to get people uh, uh, excited, but uh, I asked a, a friend who is a VC in Silicon Valley uh, to take this uh, exercise and let me share what he came up with. So he priced or he guessed that virtual market based off of this information that, that we provided in the market would be uh, 11 million for virtual market, 13 million for distort labs, and 15, minute, 15 million for reality bites. Uh, he took basically the, uh, looked at the, uh, the, the median pricing of the last year, felt that the kind of AR VR market is not as hot as it was a year ago, and so discounted accordingly. But this is assuming that these companies were to be funded. Here's where he thought the, the pre-money valuation would shake out at. And then we can talk about the crowd. Uh, what did we put? Uh, you all put virtual market, I think, at 5 million, Distort Labs at 8 million, and Reality Bytes, we said, at around 10 million. Um, there was a question I saw on the, or a comment on the, the chat box around uh, the wisdom of the crowds, which I actually think is, is a really interesting point and, and one that we actually use a lot in, in various kind of prediction markets. So uh, oftentimes if, if you gamble sports books, right, that, that you have a process where an expert sets a, a line and then that aligned adjusts based on how the crowd is, is betting and, and actually did a in business school and analysis on that. And it's really interesting that, that the crowd, the wisdom of the crowd is, is really quite strong there. Uh, there's also, if you've ever done that experiment where 
uh, you're guessing how many pennies are in a jar. Uh, I, I think it's often the case that the average or the median of all the crowd's guesses uh, ends up being the most accurate. So uh, a lot of interesting takeaways there. Uh, one final question and then we'll discuss and I'll, I'll share with you some frameworks. So now I, I want you to actually assume that you are going to make an investment in one of these companies. And this is where we start to get into the conversation around value versus price. Uh, so uh, you have now three options. So we're gonna go with uh, the VC's benchmark. So option one is to invest at virtual market at an $11 million pre-money valuation. Distort Labs at a $13 million pre-money valuation. Our Reality Bytes at a $15 million pre-money valuation. So Trafton, put up our final poll question. And Trafton, I, I, there's a lot of questions uh, that kind of go beyond the scope of this. I can stay on. Can we leave the, the, the webinar open a little bit longer? I'm happy to stay an extra 10 or so minutes. Yeah, I think we can do that. All right, we'll give you a few more seconds to make your choice. Okay. Okay, so it looks like, uh, so we, we are our most common uh, uh, response would be that folks would invest if they had to. I'm sure many of you would pass, but uh, Distort Labs at a $13 million pre-money valuation, uh, Virtual Markets at an $11 million valuation, and then Reality Bytes at a $15 million valuation. So a, a few things here. So, so, you know, amongst these three options, you know, certainly the, the cheapest one from, from your perspective would be virtual markets. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, is you know, is for, for you to be successful in the venture world, what needs to happen, arguably, there, there needs to be a liquidity event or an exit. So if only one of these companies has a successful exit, well, then that's going to be the right choice. And it wouldn't matter whether you paid $15 million at the Series A or $11 million at the Series A. So that's something to, to think about. The other thing to think about is, you know, it's, it's not a zero sum game, right? So, so you're investing in this company and then you're becoming a stockholder in this company and having too high a valuation can handicap the company down the road if they can't sustain that valuation. So that's something to think about. Another thing to think about, and this is especially prevalent in Silicon Valley is often success in the Valley is less about who has the best company are is first with an idea, it's who has the best access to capital. And so in that case, maybe you would look at Reality Bytes and say, hey, these guys are, are well uh, positioned. They have relationships with VCs. They've already gotten a term sheet from a leading VC fund. So there you may weigh the kind of the, their access to capital both now and in the future uh, more heavily against the other two. Um, so now let's talk about valuations and kind of a, a framework of valuations. And, and I'll end and talk about some of the, the valuation methods that folks brought up, the more scientific approaches. But um, there's a picture up on the screen. This is a, another excellent book. Uh, it's now on its fourth edition by Brad Feld and Jason Mendelson, who are both uh, uh, successful VCs based out of Boulder, Colorado. They wrote this book um, a number of years back and they keep updating it. Uh, it's called Venture Deals, and then the subtitle is Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer and Venture Capitalist. And they have a chapter in the book on valuations. And the first thing to, to realize, and, and we'll come back to this, and, and why it's difficult to deploy some of these financial models like uh, discounted cash flow, even, even models that are, are more 
adapted for startups like the Chicago method, uh, Black Scholes option pricing, is that it's it's quite speculative, right? So you're making some significant assumptions about the the trajectory of this business, and often you're in verticals that that are uh, uh, haven't been tested, uh, and and for example, um, excuse me, take a drink. Uh, if you're, you're, for any of you that have seen a startup presentation, you know, every startup has that same slide where they project their future growth and they show hockey stick growth. So you have to test that assumption. So the first thing to understand is it, it's, it's all speculative, even some of the more scientific approaches beyond just guesstimation. But so in venture deals, they talk about factors uh, that they think impact valuations. And so the first I'll, I'll go through these quickly is, is obvious, certainly the, the stage of a company, a company that is pre-revenue or even pre-product should fetch a lower valuation that, than one that's further along in their development. Uh, this is a big one. And I, I think this probably drives valuations or differences in valuations more than anything. And, and this is competition with other funding sources. So in our example, right, the two startups had uh, uh, competitive uh, offers from a corporate venture fund and a, a leading uh, 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 Silicon Valley fund. Um, so, you know, a lot of what drives Silicon Valley is, is this idea of FOMO, our fear of missing out. And, and many VCs are, are more disturbed by passing on a, on a deal that eventually becomes a unicorn versus investing in a startup that goes nowhere. So again, this probably drives things more than, than anything else, arguably. Then certainly the experience of the entrepreneurs and the leadership team, right? We incorporated this into our exercise, all things being equal, right? You should value a, a, a company that has uh, entrepreneurs that have been there before and successfully sold companies. Certainly the, the size and trendiness of the market um, is going to impact the valuation. And this is something that should go into your assessments. So you should really be spending a lot of time not thinking about the value of, of specific startups within a vertical, but the value and size of that vertical itself. Uh, you know, trendiness here definitely impacts uh, valuations. And I threw in that little uh, uh, thing about the, the second company utilizing blockchain technologies. We've seen that cooled off a bit, but certainly if, if you had uh, blockchain in, in your, 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 your deck somewhere a couple of years ago, uh, that got people excited. Uh, this is an important one and one I'm gonna spend a, a bit more time on. And, and uh, this is the, the VC's natural entry point. And so uh, most VCs are, aren't looking to invest in, in companies at, at any stage of, of their development, right? Most VCs, if you ask them their investment thesis, they'll say, you know, we're a, a seed stage investor. We invest in, you know, pre-revenue, pre-product uh, medical devices uh, or things like that. And oftentimes, and, and this is a really important point, that as part of this investment thesis, these VCs will have a pricing strategy. And the extreme example of this are incubators and accelerators. So uh, let's talk about 500 startups and, and Y Combinator, for example, right? Both run an a incubator and accelerator where they, they take companies into their program. And these companies come from all different verticals. You know, they're usually uh, more or less around the same stage of development, but there are some discrepancies. But these, when 500 startups, YC, or, or many other incubators, uh, accelerators, they invest as part of their program. And regardless of the company, the vertical, the experience of the entrepreneurs, they pay the same price for every single one of those companies. Their argument being, well, it's totally speculative at this point, right? We've got some market leverage or power, so it's kind of a take it or leave it deal. And uh, um, we're not gonna spend the time or money trying to think about different valuations and negotiating for all of these, these different startups because we're investing at scale. The next one is, is to the degree there are some finances, if the company has been in operation, if you're investing at a later stage, you can look at their burn rate, other things. Um, you know, hopefully most startups will have done some research around the, the market that they're addressing and you can look at those things. Definitely the, the current economic climate uh, impacts that. And then related, this is something that I'm adding, adding to this list would be, uh, this should say liquidity and size of the venture fund. And, and this is something, um, you know, 
this is kind of a bit the, uh, the soft bank phenomenon, where if, if you have a, a, an investor or investors um, that are, are you know, have these massive funds and, and capital that they need to deploy, right? You know, if they look at a deal and say, well, this startup only wants 10 million, but we really need to invest 100 million. And well, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to own 90% of the company. So we're going to, this is an extreme example, but we're going to push that valuation up so that, that we can, you know, invest a large amount of capital and own an appropriate amount of the company. So these are all factors that we see driving valuations in Silicon Valley. Um, oh, let me go, I'm missing a slide, hold on. Give me just one sec, folks. I'm gonna bring up my final slide. All right, so it looks like it's missing. I'm gonna, we'll type this up in real time. I think I lost my final slide, but here, just a few notes. So here's kind of having spent the, the last, you know, decade or so working with different types of investors and, and running these programs, a, a few observations um, uh, around valuations. And, and so it, my first observation is, is kind of the importance of having a pricing strategy. And if you think about how we did this exercise, right, we kind of started off by, by kind of throwing you into a room where we said, hey, here's this novel idea, this startup, and without any information, we want you to value the startup. And the results were all over the map. If you remember the outcome of that first uh, uh, poll question, right? It was the, the distribution was all over the place. And then what we started to do was kind of introduce this concept of, of having a pricing strategy, right? Where we started by looking at a, a vertical um, where, where either you had some experience or we gave you some background information. It was very limited in our exercise. We just kind of provided the, the average price of, of similar deals over the, the prior year, but then what you saw was that actually started to reduce the variability of the crowd or the group's responses, right? And so, and in the world of venture capital, especially early stage venture capital, where you're responsible for your own legal fees, et cetera, right? This is really important. And so thinking about strategies like Y Combinator or 500 startups, where, you know, you may not have the leverage to basically pay the same price for everything, but what you can do is have a target price based off of your investment thesis and then adjust based off of a framework. And maybe that framework is the, the um, you know, those, those categories from venture deals where you say, well, my target, I'm, I, I invest in pre-product uh, ag tech companies and based off of my research, my target price, I'm looking to pay, you know, a $10 million pre-money valuation, investing $2 million, and maybe I'll adjust up or down based off of the experience of the entrepreneurs, based off of the competitiveness of the deals. Uh, and then finally, uh, my kind of final piece of advice or, or what I want to leave you with is really, you know, distinguishing between price slash valuation and value. So uh, we had a few questions come up and, and, and around kind of uh, various pricing models. And, and so, you know, I've, I've heard a few that the, the, certainly there's, you know, the discounted cash flow, which is kind of if you go to a business school or take finance courses, the, the kind of first one that you learn. Uh, someone mentioned the Chicago method, which is kind of this hybrid discounted cash flow options method where you uh, look at the kind of the probability of success, best case versus worst case scenario planning. 
Um, uh, it's, it's again pretty speculative. Um, I've heard of others kind of introducing an, a Black Shoals method into the startup world. So I, I think these are all interesting and good, but something to keep in mind is, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be a, a, in most competitive uh, venture deals, there's going to be a, a market price, right? And, and you're going to have often the option of either taking the deal or, or passing on the deal. So if you're using the, the Chicago method or Black Shoals and you come up with a valuation that says, hey, this startup is worth $5 million, but the, the company, as we saw in our example, has you know, uh, offers from other investors where they're paying you know, offering 10 million, well, maybe then the purpose of your valuation is, is going to be, I'm going to pass on this deal. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think, you know, you could probably share that method with the startup and they'll say, oh, you know, that's a cool thing that you did, but Sequoia is willing to, to invest at a $10 million pre-money valuation. So maybe we'll come back to you in the future. Um, so it, it's something to, to think about. And I, I think I, I've spent some time uh, just this last week with a, a, a corporate venture fund and, and they talked about the method that they use, which is really th this sort of, uh, they use kind of a Black Shoals approach and the idea being, hey, you know, at least we have a, a internal guide to, we can say, well, you know, we're paying a lot more than we value this internally or our, it's kind of this money ball approach where if you have your own valuation method, well, and you're consistent with it, maybe that helps you with your pricing strategy or that's part of your pricing strategy. But again, the big takeaways here is kind of don't approach this thing like a guesstimate. As part of your investment thesis, have a pricing strategy. It's great if that pricing strategy involves kind of internal tools like the Chicago method, et cetera. Um, and then, but ultimately, your, your decision is often going to be based off what the market decides it's going to be. And, and I think we talked a little bit, it showed kind of how the market worked. And then kind of the, the last point in, of this exercise is to kind of help you understand, because I think a lot of angel investors struggle with this, right? You go to a, a demo day, you see an exciting company, they've got a great presentation. It's a technology you have no familiarity with, you've never worked with. And so you're kind of just starting from scratch. Well, well that's not really the approach of most seasoned investors where it really starts with knowledge about a vertical uh, that's connected to your investment thesis and then looking for, for winners in that space. And it's not always the first company that, that's there and it's not always the company with the best team or the best technology. So um, I'll, I'll end with a question and then I'll ask, uh, I'll stick around for a bit, but um, you know, we can kind of take a, 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 we won't take a formal poll, but let me ask, uh, who's heard of, of Uber? And so my assumption is you're all raising your hand. Uh, who's heard of Lyft? My assumption is you're all raising your hand. Uh, now let me ask, uh, who's heard of Sidecar? My, my assumption is many less, if not most of you, uh, have not raised your hand for Sidecar. Well, if we think about kind of car sharing um, and, and what, you know, the, the main line of business for Uber and Lyft, um, Sidecar was actually the first one to do that, the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing. But they weren't able to kind of scale for a number of reasons and, and they no longer exist today, but they were the first to do that. So if you were interested in investing in that space and, and you saw, well, Sidecar is the first to do this, right? You would ultimately not be, you know, uh, celebrating your, your success on, on Twitter or otherwise today. So. We did a lot. Uh, this was just to kind of get your, whet your appetite and to think a bit about some of these issues. I, I know, you know some of you were, were looking for more definitive uh, breakdowns of, of these kind of financial models. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to figure out another time to, to do that, but fortunately it's difficult to do over a, uh, a hour long webinar, but uh, hopefully you have now kind of a framework for thinking about how things happen and how you might incorporate those. But again, uh, you know, our, our, our purpose here was to kind of get you uh, uh, excited or thinking about the valuation game, which is messy. It's speculative. It's based off a lot of non-financial metrics, uh, et cetera. So uh, with that, I will, um, I think this will end the formal part of our, our webinar. And, and I will, I know there's a lot of questions and I'll spend the next 15 minutes or so going through those.